And I remember when I was a kid and people would always say, uh, you know, because I was one of those typical depressed adolescent types. I wrote poetry and stuff. It's how morose I was as a kid. And people would go around saying, oh, cheer up, man, because God loves you. And I'd always say, big deal. God loves everybody. That don't make me special. Hello again. Um, here we are, part three of Does God Love Everyone? And honestly, you, sh you knew from the very beginning of the first video the answer to the question now we're just going to address objections versus that seem to say that God loves everyone and we already know that God um, only God can save someone people cannot save themselves there there's no such thing as free will God decides who will be saved because we are sinners and not a single one of us will ever decide to trust in God so in order for anyone to be saved God has to change their heart and cause them to love him so God uh, since God is the one who saves God decides who will be saved then God saves those he loves we know that God hates sin God hates the sinner and everyone is a sinner so unless God changes something about sin, then he cannot and will not love any of us. Um, I didn't do this in the other videos because I kind of just messed up. So I wanted to give a, a couple of the reasons why I uh, decided to look into this and Part of this you you see in the video that I have at the beginning of this with Rich Mullins. What is what is the meaning of indiscriminate love? The uh, the popular notion today is that God loves everyone. God wants to save everyone. This love is the same love that He has for believers. The same love that He has for His Son the same love that he has for unbelievers it's it's all the same god's love is is universal and it's um in a sense unconditional at least that's what it's it's described as it's it's this strange indiscriminate love where everyone receives it um but at the same time the bible describes describes this love as the love God has for his bride, for his his wife. We, the church, are his bride. And yet, we have believed for many years that this love for us, for the church, is the same love that God has for the unbeliever, for the sinner, for the rebellious hater of God. And that these two are these two relationships as far as God is concerned are identical he loves the sinner and he loves the church and the only difference is that one believes in him and loves him back and the other one doesn't but if we take even a superficial look at this analogy this metaphor for God to love the bride in the same way that he loves someone who despises him uh, someone separate is this is plainly adultery if a man says I love you to every woman he meets and he and he pledges to marry every woman he marries one or or more and he still continues to say I love you to every woman in the street here and there what does that even mean? And it's, uh, I mean, I know it's just an illustration, but it, it kind of gets to the heart of the, the issue here. If we're not special, if I mean, if everyone is special, then no one is special. If the Christian is not special to God and separate from um, the unbeliever, what is the point of 
being chosen? What is the point of being elect? The the whole issue, the whole thing with Israel was that God separated them. He chose them. And he entered into covenant with them. And they were his special people, his bride that he loved. And no one else could say that. And I, and I think that that was a reflection of his nature. And his nature doesn't change. And the whole idea of a special elect, a special love for the believer is a reflection of God's nature. And that, and that is something that doesn't change whether we are Old Covenant or New Covenant or whether um, we have Christ or whether we have uh, the Old Sacrifice. <clears throat> and I think that God loving those who believe in Him with a special covenant love and, and showing kindness to to everyone is the real situation where, where God only loves those he saves and if he you cannot call it love when he he doesn't save you that, that if, if he allows you or he chooses you for you to burn in hell forever there that is nothing like love so these are some of the issues that i that i just was concerned about i wanted to look into and, and this is a conclusion that i've come to so here we're going to look at some of the specific verses um they kind of don't seem to fit in with with this god only loves his chosen people so this is a summary of what what i've been through in the other videos so i'm not going to talk more about this here are the verses, at least a few of them, and they I think they cover most, if not all, I think they cover everything in the Bible that might be an objection. Ezekiel 18.32, I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, therefore repent and live. On the surface, this seems to say that God wants everyone to repent. And in a sense, Jesus commands everyone to repent. But the idea here is what God wants. And specifically, he is talking to his people. He does not want any of his people, his chosen nation, to perish. So he is talking to them. I do not want any of you to, to die. I want you to, re to return to me, to repent and be saved from your sin. And we see this all throughout this chapter. He is talking to Israel. He's not talking to all the other nations. And obviously that that's the whole case with all the Old Testament. His relationship was with only Israel. And that, I think, should extend into the New Testament. His relationship is with his people that he's chosen. Um, he doesn't want any that he has chosen to perish. And so that's, what, uh, that's the idea that we're going to see in the New Testament. 1 Timothy 2, 4, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Again, it seems to say that God wants everyone, every person, everywhere to be saved, but we know that he doesn't. We know that uh, Pharaoh, again in Romans 9, he specifically used Pharaoh to demonstrate his wrath. Again, First Peter two eight, God appoints men to to damnation. So we know that God does not want all men to be saved. And if we look closely at this passage, God, Paul is talking about all men, kings and men in authority, and he, and the idea is that he's talking about men in authority and men out of authority, men who are kings and men who are not kings. All men for kings and men in authority, and so that that is the uh, the idea here. Not not every man everywhere, but both kings and and subjects. Yeah. <clears throat> First John two two. He himself is a propiti propitiation for sins, not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. On the surface, this Bible this verse seems to say that. Everyone is going to be saved. 
unbeliever, believer, everyone has had their sins paid for and covered. That's what propitiation means. And so everyone will be saved. But we know that that's not true. Not everyone will believe. And so not everyone will uh, apply the sacrifice and the forgiveness that Christ has bought for us. He, uh, John says here, he himself is a propitiation for our sin. So we need to look at what is he saying by our if you go back to the very beginning of the book, he says what we have seen, what we have heard, what we have held with our hands. He is speaking about himself and the apostles when he speaks of we. We includes those who are spreading the gospel as eyewitnesses of Christ's life and death. When he speaks in the first person, he's talking about himself and the apostles, the Jews. Christ is not only a propitiation for us, us apostles, us eyewitnesses, but for everyone who believes, anyone in the whole world. If you look at John 3.16, we're going to do in, in a minute, <clears throat> it's the same idea. Not everyone will be saved, but anyone in the world, not just the Jews, not just the eyewitnesses, but anyone who, who believes in Christ can be saved anyone in the world not not every person in the world does God love or, or will be saved and here in John 3 16 God is speaking of those he loves when Jesus talked to Nicodemus he said this right here for God so loved and I believe that what Nicodemus expected was for him to say for God so loved the Jews. So when Christ said the world, this was another shock. I mean, this whole this whole chapter is a shock to Nicodemus. He didn't. He had trouble understanding it. And then when he said the world, when when Nicodemus was obviously he knew that God loved the Jews, so he was expecting Christ to say the Jews, but he said the world. Um, but Nicodemus knew that. In order for God to be in a relationship with people, in order for God to love anyone, there had to be some some kind of mitigation or covering or something had to be done about sin in order for God to uh, to love a sinner, to be in a, a relationship with him, to not have his wrath be upon this person, sin had to be dealt with. And so that's what Jesus says in the next in the next part of the sentence here. He gave his only son, begotten son, as a sacrifice, which he, we didn't find that out till later, at least Nicodemus didn't. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So here, this answers the question of who God loves, whoever believes in him. And we see this um, in Psalm 145, 20, God keeps those who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. <clears throat> you must be born again, Jesus says this at the beginning of the chapter. Whoever believes will have eternal life. But God loves the world as opposed to only the Jews. But only those in the world who believe in Christ. If you look at Revelation, which is another book by John, you see God saves people from every tribe and tongue and nation. And this is the idea of all men. Not just the Jews, but all men in the world he loves um, because they love him. In, in the, end of, the end of this chapter, it, or at the, the rest of this uh, passage, Christ says, He who does not believe is judged already. So he separates those who believe and are loved from those who do not believe and are judged. And uh, uh, one thing to remember is that God decides who will believe. It is not up to our free will. If it were our free will, then this would be a very easy question. God loves those who God loves everyone, 
and everyone who believes in him is saved and so it's easy it's free will it's easy but that doesn't fit the major that doesn't fit scripture at all so we have to put everything together at the same time um, just to finish up some questions on the meaning of the, the world in John and, and to show that it doesn't always mean everyone in the world. Uh, here's some, some verses. So first John uh, John 1 9 talks about the physical world, Jesus enter the world. In one verse we have the physical world and also the world of unbelievers. So you you guys need to look these up. I don't I'm not looking them up right now. So <clears throat> Um, anyway, these verses talk about, specifically talk about believers. Here are verses where we talk about unbelievers. So the world means different things depending on what, what the verse is saying. This one, it says, the realm of Satan's rule. These, again, are followers of Jesus. This is the Pharisees saying the world has gone after him. They're not talking about all the world, obviously, because they're not going after him. And they're not talking about believers, because not everyone who followed after Jesus was a believer. Some of them just wanted food, or some of them just wanted to look at the miracles. And here these verses are talking about uh, forgiveness and justification, um, life from God. So we know those are believers. And here these verses talk about condemnation and, and uh, wrath, so we know those are unbelievers. So the world, this phrase, the world... It means different things. It doesn't mean everyone in the world in every context. That's that's just nonsense. Um, the last slide I think is important, probably. How do we evangelize now that we know God doesn't love everyone? But one thing I noticed, and this is seems like a glaring omission, if you look up love in the in the gospels trying to find somewhere that Jesus says I love all of you God loves all of you so uh, come to me and and be saved he doesn't do that he doesn't say I love you therefore you should uh, believe in me Christ's first words in in his sermon in Mark especially is repent he never Appeal to the unbeliever, come to me so that, uh, come to me because I love you. He says, come to me, all you who are weary. He says, repent, but he never, he never directly relates love, his universal love to, uh, to this appeal for salvation. If you look at Peter, Peter straight up condemned everyone. Right after, uh, right after Pentecost, during the, the week after Passover, Peter said, you guys hung him on a cross. He was your only hope for salvation, and you guys crucified him. He didn't say God loves you. He said repent. So I don't know why things have changed. This guy here, Jonathan Edwards, he, one of his famous sermons entitled Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. His basic point was that all of you can die at any second and God is angry with you and you're going to burn in hell. So get your stuff together. And that's, and that's the point. We don't tell uh, the sinner of God loves them. We tell them to repent, and those that do repent, we know God loves. Everyone else, He doesn't. So I think that's uh, I think that's the real tact that we need to take. Anyway, um, this is the end of the discussion for all eternity. No one should ever disagree with me ever again. I'm not going to do a video on this again. I'll probably do a video on free will because that kind of came up a couple times. But God doesn't love sinners. Period.
maybe not period, but if they come to Christ, we know that he loves them. But if they don't, he doesn't. So have a good night, everybody. See you later. Bye-bye.